Circuit Essentials. I'm going to see how fast and effectively I can fit these concepts into your puny brains with thunder and rain in the background. Just ignore that. So, uh, voltage and current. Uh, most people probably think they have a good handle on what that is, but in my experience, I need to explain the difference and give some examples. Uh, we'll go into op amps, operational amplifiers, their importance, how they operate. They're very critical for all types of circuit operations. Um, using op amp circuits as building blocks for more complicated circuits. Linearity is an uh, important concept, mathematical concept that comes into play very heavily. I'll go over that and then I'll do some circuits combined using linearity and op-amp circuit building blocks. So first of all you have to understand how can you have a voltage without a current? And how can you have current without a voltage? These Understanding these two things helps to understand voltage and current, uh, the difference between the two. And in particular, having a voltage without a current comes into play significantly in op-amp uh, functionality. So having a voltage without a current. Here's one example. A battery. It's got a voltage difference between the two ends, between the two terminals. There's no current unless you consider the fluctuational currents inside, but those we can ignore for all intents and purposes, for ideal cons considerations throughout this entire lecture. Okay, so how about a non-zero voltage and current? That's the typical thing that you would expect to be working with. So we have a battery that is holding a constant 1.5 volts. And we'll, whenever we consider a battery for this example here, it will always be a, an ideal battery that holds 1.5 volts. Uh, there'll be one exception. It'll come up. Uh, the current always goes in the opposite direction of the electrons, thanks to Benjamin Franklin. So, what determines the voltage across the resistor? We have a current coming out of the battery, and what does that does that current determine the voltage? You might think Ohm's law, V equals IR, Ohm's law, uh, uh, resistors follow Ohm's law. So if we change the resistance, what are we changing? Are we changing both V and I? V equals IR? Well, VR is always the same in this, in this case because it's, in par it's parallel with the, the battery, right? The tops... Are the are matching? They're they're on the on the same wire, the same conductor, the bottoms. That's the definition of parallel. So, VR is constant. So, what determines I? Well, if VR is constant and the resistor follows Ohm's law, it's I times R. Then I depends on R because V is constant. So it's just I is a function of one over R. So no matter what you do with R, if you change R to whatever value with one caveat coming up, VR will remain constant. Now power, if you have a dissipative element like a resistor, then it's convention to say that power is positive. It's being dissipated into the resistor then there there must be there's a flood warning here there must be a uh, power coming from somewhere to be dissipating so that power is coming from the battery that's a negative power so um 
power computation does not involve Ohm's law, or it doesn't have to. As you can see here, the power being um, provided by the battery is I times V, and there's no Ohm's law involved in that. Ohm's law for the resistor, the power being dissipated in the resistor, um, you will use Ohm's law to calculate that. And that that's necessary in order to know how much power is being delivered by the battery, or you could just measure the voltage across the battery and the current coming out of it, and you would know that that much power being delivered must be dissipated in the circuit. So now if you add a resistor, you have multiple resistors, then you have a variable voltage. You have, you have voltages that change and current that changes with those voltages. And the way that th these are all variable is through the resistances. So <clears throat> no longer do we have just a constant voltage across each of these resistors. The, the relative voltage across each one depends on the relative size of these resistors. The total voltage across, so the voltage from here to here is always constant. That's the same, because that's determined by the battery. So however much energy we, or however much energy is increased when you go across the battery, so there's a potential increase across the battery, that same amount of potential must be dropped. And that's the essence of Kirchhoff's voltage law KVL. Uh, it's just kind of the same idea as if you're going on a hike on a mountain and you start at one spot on your hike and you go all the way up and down, let's just say all the way up to the peak and then go down a different path. Even if you go down a different path, if you end up at the same spot you started, then your potential energy change is zero. So that's the essence of KVL is that you can sum up all the potential across each element and the sum will be zero. But still, that doesn't say anything about how to find the voltage across each of these. To do that, there's a voltage divider. So let's say we wanted to find VR1. VR1 equals, using Ohm's law, it's IR1, but we don't know what I is yet. We know it's there. Um, by the way, the, the polarities I've chosen here are somewhat arbitrary. They, they are completely arbitrary, but I, I've chosen them because I already know I've I'm at the highest potential here, which means I know I'm dropping potential from here to here. I'm dropping potential from here to here. But in a more complicated circuit, you just have to choose your polarities and choose the direction of your currents. Cho choose what you're going to label them as. In other words, just choose the labels. You're not, you're not actually choosing the voltages and currents. You're choosing the labels. And then once you plug in all the numbers, the, the signs will work themselves out as long as you haven't made a mistake somewhere. So back to VR1 equals IR1. How do we find VR1? Well, we have to know I. And what we do know about this circuit is that I goes through both resistors. So if we knew the voltage drop across both resistors, we could use Ohm's law across both at the same time. So I equals the voltage across both resistors, which is the voltage being put out by the battery, divided by the total resistance that that voltage is being dissipated across. So then if I plug I in up here, I have V bat over R1 plus R2, and then we still have the R1. So this equation here is called the voltage divider. And notice it's called a divider because we're dividing down the 
the the battery or the source voltage this is being divided by this ratio so just remember it's always the the voltage across whichever resistor you're trying to find is the current through the resistor times the resistor and so this this resistor here is always on top so I, I, I gave you a hint that uh, the battery voltage isn't always uh, always constant and this is an obvious the obvious the one obvious exception even under ideal circumstances so if you're if we're talking about ideal batteries in this case the even the ideal battery it can't hold its designed voltage because it's shorted it's it's got a, a, a clear unobstructed path from the high potential side to the low potential side across the per, a perfect conductor so it's shorting across the resistor the voltage is zero and the battery is going to burn out there's going to be infinite current essentially being pulled out of the out of the battery and it's going to get hot so if you if you've ever connected the uh, terminals of a 9 volt battery you'll notice that after a few minutes it'll get hot and it causes fires or can cause fires so how about a so we, we talked about the voltage without a current we've talked about non-zero voltage and current and now we have a zero voltage with a non-zero current how is that possible stop and think about it now I'm going to tell you if you so I, I have non-zero voltage drop across the battery I have a non-zero voltage across here where do I have zero volts well I'm dropping zero volts everywhere along the wire so if I take any location V wire from that location to that location I have zero volts but I have a non-zero current I can do this game anywhere along this wire so that's how I can have a, a current without a voltage. Okay, so we've gone over voltage without a current, current without a voltage, uh, non-zero both, and zero both. Now op amps. Um, general purpose op amp, the 741 is a, a, probably the most popular. I don't know if it's the oldest, it's just the most popular general purpose one. The idea behind the op amp to start with you have to understand the basic functionality of the op amp by itself and that is all built into this equation here the output right here is just a0 which is called the open loop gain times the difference in the inputs the inputs VP here uh, this is called the non-inverting input you'll find out why in a moment VN here, that's the inverting input, same, find out in a minute. All these numbers, 2, 3, 4, 6, those are all over here. Um, this is an example of an actual op amp that is quite common. So this gain term, uh, a typical minimal value for that gain is around 10,000. So you'll, you'll see in the spec sheets for these op amps at least 10,000 or more. The way that this op amp works, let's say VP is 5 volts, and let's say VN is 4.99 volts. Then that means, if I can move this over, V out wants to be 5 minus 4.99 is 10 millivolts times 10,000. So we have 10,000 times 10 millivolts and that is a hundred volts so it wants to be a hundred volts but I don't have a hundred volts to work with I have the supply volts the f supply values here and typical supply voltages are something like 15 minus 15 or, or 9 plus minus 9 whatever so this 100 volts is obviously not going to work. 
if we design it to to expect 100, we're only going to get 15. So <clears throat> it rails out. That's what it, uh, th these are the supply rails plus and minus 15, or whatever the, the, the they're the highest voltages, the highest and the lowest voltage in the in the circuit. They have to be. You're you're always going to design your circuit such that these are the highest and lowest voltages. So your inputs, you don't want them to be any higher or lower than those values. So it's just going to hit 15 volts for any small difference in the inputs. What about if this is 4.99 and this is 5? So now it's going to be the same 10,000, and now we're going to have a difference of minus 10. So this, this wants to be minus 100 volts. And of course it's not going to hit minus 100 volts because we don't have that much to play with. It's going to hit minus 15. It's going to rail out at minus 15. So if I look at, if I just say here we have VP and here we have VN, then my output V out everywhere VP is bigger than VN, my output is going to rail out to the positive plus rail, in this case 15 volts, and then anywhere VP is smaller than VN, it's going to rail out at minus, minus the negative rail, and so on and so forth. So it's always just this square wave. That's how that's that's how this op amp wants to work by itself. You're never going to design this around zero. You don't want this zero volts here because it's unstable. If you're designing your circuit to use just the op amp functionality by itself, it's called a comparator. Just this is called a comparator. But you don't you don't build a comparator to operate around zero. You always make sure that your the the values that you want to compare always rail out. So then, what good is it if we're always going to rail out? So a non-inverting amplifier takes the op amp. and it puts a input let's call this VP here these are all resistors if you can't tell we have an input voltage source on the plus side the non-inverting side you get the hint it's going to be non-inverting the, the trick to Analyzing these circuits is to realize that you never have current going into the op amp on the inputs. So these are always zero. Call this VN. So with those being always zero, if I take and arbitrarily label a current going this way, I, I could have labeled it going the other way, it doesn't matter. Like I said, just cho choose a direction and go with it. The numbers will work themselves out, positive or negative, however they're supposed to, based on the values you choose. So if I have current here, how do I solve this circuit? Well, I have VO. Let's draw this as a, a regular circuit looking thing. So V out is acting as an ideal source. It's, it's just supplying power coming out of its output here. <clears throat> it's not connected to anything yet. It just has this, has this negative feedback and, and I'll discuss in a minute why this is so critical. This feedback from the output to the VN, the inverting input. So this op amp is acting as an ideal source right here at the output. So if I follow V out, go across RF, then this node here is this node here. So that's my I'm going to label that as VN, then to ground I have RS, 
and this current, if I, if I label it the same way as that, it goes like this. Here's the critical thing. In order to relate this, these values in this circuit to something useful, namely in order to relate V out to V in, see if I, if I have V out over V in, that's the gain of my circuit. That's the de definition of the gain. However much you put in, multiply it by the gain, that's how much you get out. So I, I need to find this relationship. With, with, this, with this circuit drawing here, I can, I can find a relationship between V out and V in. But I need to make a relationship between V n and V in somehow. This just adds unnecessary complexity. The way I do that is to realize that this op amp actually wants to do this. That's what it wants to do. If I just start with assuming VP is greater than VN, then knowing how the op amp by itself works, if VP is greater than VN, because of this huge gain, I'm just going to hit the positive rail. If I, hit the po if I hit the positive rail on this circuit right here, that's the highest voltage that I have available on this entire circuit. Because remember, the highest voltage and the lowest voltage are here. That's, those are my plus rail and minus rail. And those values determine what I'm getting on the output. So my, outp my, my output here, it wants to act like this. So that high value is sensed by this VN, this non-inverting, or this inverting input because of this feedback. Sure, there's a, there's a divider here, it's getting, you know, it's, it's losing some energy here to get to here, but this, this argument works just fine as long as VP and VN are close enough because this high voltage here being fed back increases Vn to now be bigger than v, Vp. So the assumption was Vn was small. The assumption was Vn was smaller than Vp. Because Vn was smaller than Vp, we hit our positive rail. That, that makes it so that Vn is now bigger than Vp. And because of that, we hit our minus rel. So notice, notice that no matter which one I started with, whether I started with this assumption or started with this assumption, it would have gone to the other one naturally. So I'm just going to go back and forth, back and forth, oscillating here until what? Think about, think about what, what's going to stop this from oscillating there's going to be some stability criterion to stop this from oscillating and that, that criterion is when VP equals VN because otherwise VP is greater than VN or VP is less than VN and in order for that oscillation to stop back and forth then VP equals VN and that's what happens the negative feedback stabilizes the output such that VP equals Vn. So that that allows us to relate this Vn to now Vp. So we know that Vn equals Vp, so that this node now we, we can call that Vp. Now how do we relate Vp to Vn? Well here's Vp Here's V in. And by the way, when I say VP, if I say a voltage here, it has no meaning to say, here's a voltage. It's always, here's a voltage with respect to something else. Voltage at this location with respect to another location. So voltage here with respect to ground. That's always, that's the definition of a node voltage. So anytime you're looking at a circuit and somebody puts a, a, a probe somewhere and says, what's the voltage here? It means here with respect to ground. 
here with respect to ground, whichever these are these are all the same common ground. So all these voltages are all with respect to ground. Vn is with respect to ground, Vp, v, V0. So if I if I have no current here, remember the inputs don't accept a current. I have no current across this resistor. According to Ohm's law, if I have no current across the resistor, then I have no voltage dropped across that resistor. I have no energy lost across that resistor because there's no current. <clears throat> so that means my Vp equals Vn. So let's use another color. Vp equals Vn. So now we can relate V in to V out through through this circuit here. Well, V in, the voltage here with respect to ground, is across this resistor. That's the voltage across RS. So looking at looking at this current through both resistors. I'm trying to find the voltage across one of the resistors. That's that's what I just did before the voltage divider. So go back and review the voltage divider and see that I have V in, which is the voltage across here, <clears throat> is equal to V out. That's the voltage that is being divided across both resistors. And then the divider equation is it's across RS and the total volt the total resistance in the branch. So now if I want to get my gain term, my gain defined as V out over V in, if I re rewrite this in brackets, it's one uh, the it's essentially the inverse of that in brackets. That's my gain term for the non-inverting amplifier. So now the inverting amplifier. It's always going to have negative feedback. That's what stabilizes it so that we can say Vn equals Vp equals Vn. That's always the case for negative feedback. I in is equal to zero for all the op amps. That's the ideal circumstance that we have to consider to solve these circuits. Here's VP, here's VN. Now RS, I used to I used to have the source on uh, the input on this side, on the VP side, but now I have to figure out how to put it on the VN side. Where, where would be a natural place to put it on the VN? Well, if I, if I tried to put something here, even if I put a resistor here, before I had something over here, but now I'm going to have to ground this because I have nothing there. I can't just let it float. So my, my VP side has to be grounded. That means my VN has a virtual ground because of this VP equals VN. That's, that's always the case for this negative feedback. This negative feedback ensures that that's the case. So if if my VP is grounded, and remember there's no current, so this, this resistor does nothing. If my VP is grounded, that means my VN has a virtual ground on it. It's, it's, it's a zero volts. And if this is always at zero volts, what good is this VN, VN going to do being right here? This is always zero volts. So no matter what happens here, there's nothing happening here. So this does nothing. So this has to be gone here because it would do nothing right there. And same thing over here. If I put, if I tried to put this guy on the output, then my input would be tied to the output. That would be stupid. So it has to. The only other place that it could be is right here. So now let's let's do the same analysis we did before. Uh, draw an arbitrary current. I, I I know that my current has to go down, 
it, it, there's no current going in through, into my inputs, so that's it doesn't branch off. So if I if I draw this as starting with V in, I have V in. I go across R S. That gets me to this node, which is the V N node. Across R F. And that gets me to V out. And of course these are all V in is the voltage relative to ground or common. Same with V out. It didn't have to be that way. I mean it could have this V in could have arbitrarily been floating somewhere, but then we would have had to redefine what it meant to be V uh, the voltage right here with respect to ground, because that's what we're trying to find, the relationship between V out with respect to ground relative to something else with respect to ground. So we're going to find an effective way of writing some voltage with respect to ground anyway. So we have Vn equals Vp equals zero volts, because it's grounded. It's got a virtual ground, so we're just going to add that right there. If I follow the current, it starts at V0, goes like this, and like that. Notice that this current goes through this node. It goes directly through this node. And you never get a current going into the ground. It's easy to see that that current only goes through this. So that, that node is the same as this right here. It's easy to see that this node doesn't go, I mean, it doesn't have any current branching off anywhere else. But what I'm talking about is because this is grounded, this is virtually grounded. So I could have drawn this anywhere, I and mean, I could have drawn it up here. It doesn't matter where I draw it, it's just a, it's just a label. It's just saying it's grounded, it's zero volts right there with respect to the rest of the circuit. So I'm, I'm at zero volts with respect to the rest of the circuit, but it doesn't, just because I've drawn this in here, it doesn't mean that I can allow a, a current to go through there. I can't just arbitrarily start sending currents through labels. <clears throat> Same thing here. I can't just arbitrarily send a current through there. So we've decided that this this current definitely goes directly through the node and continues. So then I can relate the current here to ground to the current here from ground through this through this source. I'm just going to re rewrite this current I. It's I right here. And it's I right here. So notice the voltage across this resistor it makes sense to label it this way, positive on the top, because then I can, I mean, it's just arbitrary. I could have done it backwards. It doesn't really matter, but it's, it's better to do it this way because I already know that I have, my V in is plus minus there. I have V in volts going from here, dropping down to here. But notice this current. So if I have a resistor, that I'm trying to use Ohm's law across, and I make some assumption about the polarity of the voltage across it, then if I go in and I label the current through it, you, you always cross the tail and put a minus on the head. Notice that these pluses here are the same, and the, they're on the same side, and the minuses are on the same side. So then, then you can use Ohm's law, IR, whereas if it was backwards, if I had, if I had labeled the polarity this way, and I had said that my current was going this way, then notice that the polarities for, for the currents, and, and for the current and the voltage are opposite. So then it's going to follow minus uh, anti-ohm's law, if, if you can call it that. So as long as the 
arrows are pointed the same, as long as the, the signs are on the same side of the resistor, then we can use Ohm's Law. So let's use Ohm's Law across wherever we can, anti-Ohm's Law, wherever we have to. So we have voltage across RS is Vn, it's the same voltage across both of them, equals minus I times RS. So then solve for I. So then on this other, on the, on the right hand side, we have VRF is equal to V0. And the voltage across RF is just I times RF. So then solving for I, we have the same current here. We have so that's our inverting gain term. What use these have in general? So let's say you have an input that looks like this. Then the inverting amplifier, let's say you have a gain of three. The inverting amplifier is gonna amplify this by three and invert it. And then the non-inverting is obviously the exact same idea, but it's just not inverted. But what if what if we wanted to do something like take the difference between two different signals, find a difference amplifier or a summing amplifier or whatever? And then we have to start introducing the, this linearity concept. It has two properties: superposition, which mathematicians call additivity, and scaling, homogeneity. So the idea here is for superposition, if you have some input, I'll just call it x, special x. Um, if, we, if we have this input into a circuit, a linear circuit, which I'll call T, then the, the output, call Y, is going to be T acting on the input. So if we can write this input as a sum of terms, and if we can, if we can act on each one of these terms individually such that this Y ends up being the transformation of each one individually, then this, this system defined by T is linear in X. It's linear in this representation of X. It's linear in these components, the X0, the X1, and so forth. So. The way that I've decomposed this, it's linear in that. So what we're going to be looking at is cases where, say, this x0 is v0, some, some voltage source, and say this is i1, and, and then v2, and i3, whatever. <clears throat> then whatever, whatever sources we have driving the circuit, if the circuit is linear in those sources, then it's just going to be the, the, the output due to each one of those individually. So in, in the cases that I'm giving you here, these are all actually just V. So we're going to say v, V0, V1, and so forth. So that's, that's, the, that's the superposition principle then scaling is is a lot easier if you have if you have x is equal to some multiplying factor on a now we can say that these x's the reason that we want to do this is because we want to be able to define the x's as being normalized so they're 
their value in, in, in some way of explaining it is just one. The length of it is just one. So then, then we can define the amplitude of each of these x's in the k's instead of in the x's themselves. So then the scaling property says that put these into your linear system, then you're going to get out the transformation of these guys individually is, is equal to the scaled transformation of each of the basis elements individually. So the k's, the k's come out, in other words, the k's factor out. Okay, that's, that's linearity, superposition and uh, scaling. For, for this entire lecture, the most important thing is superposition. It's also important to understand how scaling comes into play for linearity. So now that we know how to use linearity, um, in particular superposition principle or additivity for the for each one of those op amp building blocks, the uh, amplifier building blocks, we can we can combine them. So inverting summer. If I have VP is grounded, and then I have VN still has its feedback, but then I split this off into two separate components, two separate inputs. So I'm feeding this side with V1 and I'm feeding this side with V2. That, that's the same thing as if I drew something like this, but it's just it takes more time to do that. More time to explain it, but now that I've explained it, I won't have to do it again. So, um, we have VP here, we have VN here. V out by the superposition principle, because it's a linear circuit, it's V out due to 1 plus V out due to 2. So what does V out do to 1? <clears throat> The out due to 1 is if I turn everything else off, and everything else in this case is just V2, because that's all I have. I have V1 and V2 powering the circuit. I, I, can, I can ignore the power the supply is going to these guys, because they don't, they're not part of the analysis. I'll, I'll, I know that this, this defines the amount of headroom that I have on both ends, so I have to design within that range. I have to design within this range here. But notice that that doesn't affect the linearity of my circuit. Right? I mean as long as I'm as long as I'm not hitting the the rails. In other words, as long as my signal is not distorted. If if I had designed this around a gain that was so large that I distorted, then it went like this. then that's a different story. Now all of a sudden I'm no longer linear. So the rails don't come into play when you're designing a linear system, a linear circuit, as long as you are operating within those within the range. So, you, so your output doesn't go beyond that range. <clears throat> so everything else about this circuit, if if it, as long as all the components operate linearly, then V1 can be considered by itself ignoring V2. So we have, if we're ignoring V2, not ignoring it, but setting it to zero. So turn, turn on only V1, set V2 to zero. If, if V2 is zero, that's zero volts, that means it's grounded. So remember that VP always equals VN. That's because of negative feedback. IN always is zero. That's because it's an op amp. So no current here, no current here. The, these, these two values here are coupled. 
So that means Vn at this point in this in this circuit, Vn has a, a a ground there. It's got a virtual ground because Vp is virtually ground is actually grounded. So if I'm if I'm grounded right here at this node, this whole node here is zero, and this value here is zero. Then watch watch what happens when I when I consider the current here. Current comes down here. This is the uh, the current that I'm considering coming out of my output. Then normally you would expect this current to branch off two different ways, right? But in order for there to be a current across a, vo uh, a, a resistor, there must be a voltage dro drop across that resistor. Because without, without energy that has to be dissipated across the resistor, you're, you're not going to get a voltage drop. I mean, you're not going to get a current. Without, without any energy to drop across the resistor, there will, there will be no current. So there is no energy across this resistor because it's, it's at the same potential on both sides. It's at zero here and it's at zero here. So, so this, this current is zero, which means we can just ignore, we can ignore this entire side. We can ignore the entire branch right there. Then this current just goes all the way through. So this should remind you of the inverting amplifier just by itself this is an inverting amplifier without v2 it's an inverting amplifier so what what is the gain term for the inverting amplifier well we have the input in this case it's v1 times the gain term minus rf over that resistance down there that's in this case it's r1 so in in the same argument if i because V2, the branch V2 that's over here that I erased is just a mirror image of this branch, then the, the gain term is going to be a mirror image. So it's going to be gain on V2, and then it's going to be the same minus RF, but this time the R2 resistor that I've erased. So there, there, there's your inverting summer. It's just a sum of these two terms that I've calculated here. Difference amplifier. Um, now we have V something on this side. We always have negative feedback. We have V, so we have V1 on, on the in, non inverting side, we have V2 on the inverting side. V out, because it's linear in these, in the sources, uh, it's linear in the inputs. V out is V out due to 1 plus V out due to 2. So V out due to 1 is V1 times its gain factor. And you'll remember the gain factor, because we're turning V2 off, with V2 off, this circuit looks exactly like the first circuit that we analyzed, the non-inverting amplifier. So that's 1 plus RF over R1. Then V out due to 2, that's when we turn V1 off. We turn V2 on. With V1 off, we're grounded there. And this is identical to the inverting amplifier. So it's V2 minus RF over R2. Summing difference amplifier. So we're going to sum the inputs on both locations and we're going to find the difference between those V1, V2, so VP, it's a linear circuit, it's linear in the, in the sort, in the inputs, so I can give it a VP due to 1 
plus VP due to 2. And there's also VP due to 3 and 4, but those are 0. VP due to 3 plus Z VP due to 4. Because when, whenever v, uh, only 3 is on, then this, then this VP node is grounded. And when only V4 is on, the same thing. So then we have Vn here. Remember Vn, we have, we have Vp always equals Vn for negative feedback. V out is V out due to 1 plus V out due to 2 plus V out due to 3 plus V out due to 4. Let's do V out due to 3 first and 4 because those are a little easier. If I turn everything off except for V3, that means th this node here is grounded. Th these two are, are, are they're, they're both grounded, so they're at the same potential. If they're grounded and I get no current through here because this doesn't accept a current, there's no current, there's no reason for any current to be in any of these, then the voltage through this entire, entire line is zero. So everything here is zero, which means Vn is zero. And since Vn is zero, remember we, we were able to erase one of these branches. So then I have V out due to three is just V3 times the gain term, which is negative Rf over R3. So the same thing for V4, negative Rf, R4. Okay, so now one and two. That's when these guys are turned off. So I'm going to ground these, but notice what happens when I ground these, and I um, might as well ground one of these. So let's let's look at this this bottom node first. This guy right here. It's critical that I have this resistor and whatever resistance I have here in order to determine the gain term that V1 is going to see. So. R3 and R4 are, are in parallel. So how do you how do you write parallel? Well, it's a, an effective resistance. It's the sum of one over each resistor that's parallel. So in this case, it's one over R3 plus one over R4, which equals R3, R4 over R3 plus R4, and we're going to call that R34. So I have R34 right here, and it's grounded. Remember I, I said up here on VP, we're going to consider VP due to 1, VP due to 2, and so forth. So we have V out due to 1, is equal to VP due to 1 times the gain term that would typically be seen at that node for, for putting an input on that node. We're just, we're just replacing V1 with VP1. In the case when we did the non-inverting summary, it was just V1, but now it's VP1 because that's what value is seen at the VP input. So it's whatever is seen at the VP input. That's, what's, that's what we're looking for. So <clears throat> VP1 is seen at the VP input, and that's what sees the gain, 1 plus RF over R34. Then we have v, v out 2 is due to the, the source on the 2. Then that's going to be the same exact gain term. Now... Notice that these are identical gain terms, but the, the VP1 and VP2 are different. So what are these VP1 and VP2? V1 is a, is a source that gives us the highest potential here, and then we drop potential across here, and then we drop more down to ground here. So I know that there's current flowing through this entire set right here. I have current flowing through both resistors because of this V1. I know that I have no current going through here, as usual. So 
whatever whatever amount I'm trying to find here is the voltage that's dropped across R2. V1 is being divided, and it's always the voltage across R2 divided by the total resistance in that uh, in those series resistors. So then the the, the same the sort of same argument for VP2 except now it's going to be when V2 is on and we have R1 this time that remains that that's the voltage across R1 to ground and then it's R1 plus R2 I, I wrote R3 over here so now we have these VO1 VO1 has whatever is seen on the, the non-inverting node times the gain, but that value that's seen on the non-inverting node is actually this value here that's being divided. It's, a, it's, it's the actual input that has a, divide, a divided value on it. So we're, we're, depleting, we're depleting the inputs already. So we have, to, we have to compensate for the depleted input on the, on the gain term. That's just how it works for a non-inverting amplifier. The non-inverting input, if you do superposition on the inputs, then you get these dividers out there on the front. All right, so that's pretty much all that I want to say about these circuits. Good luck.